Hello, my name is Garrett Ransom. I work at Los Alamos National Laboratory in the HPC Systems Group. And I'm here to talk to you today about uh, Markive, which is an extension of an existing file system that we have called MarFS to a long-term archival system. Now, before we get directly into this, I'd like to give you some background on the nature of storage and HPC at LANL. So we perform physics simulations across a wide variety of clusters and these clusters produce large quantities of data and in turn drive a wide variety of storage requirements for the laboratory. So I'm going to go through some of these just to give you some background. Um, first of all, I want to point out that um, in this diagram, it's, a, it's a, a fair bit out of date. So some of these clusters have been replaced with newer ones. However, I'm going to be focusing on the storage aspects of this which is relatively uh, correct. So first of all, I want to point out at the bottom here, we have uh, this cloud called REDCap. This is an example of one of our FTA clusters or file transfer agents. Now these are clusters of servers that are designed to facilitate bulk data movement throughout various components of the lab storage infrastructure. Now, to actually get into the storage systems themselves and some of the tiers of storage that we have, uh, first I'll point out that, of course, each cluster has in-system memory, actual DIMMs located in the individual compute nodes. That's fairly obvious. I'm not going to go into any further detail here. Um, now, down a tier below that, we have uh, what we call burst buffer. So this is a uh, relatively new storage terminology and a relatively new tier of storage at our laboratory. And what this is, is a high bandwidth, low latency, pure flash tier that sits very, very close to the cluster nodes themselves. And the purpose of this is to absorb, as the name suggests, bursts of data coming off of these compute clusters. Specifically, these clusters can be performing calculations for weeks or months at a time as part of long running computational jobs. And in that time, failures are not only, you know, a possibility, they are an expectation. So as part of our workloads, we perform what we call checkpointing, which is where the cluster dumps out its system memory, the state of its running jobs, in this case, to this burst buffer. And that is such that if the cluster does experience a significant failure, that checkpoint can be read back from burst buffer and quickly recover state so that the job can then again continue and recover from a failure. So the demands on this are significant in terms of the bandwidth that we expect from it. Now down a tier below that is uh, our scratch file space. Uh, this is provided by the Luster Parallel File System, and this can be thought of as the workspace for cluster jobs. It is mounted on every node of the compute cluster, and it provides the general purpose area where jobs can store data, interact with data, perform updates on it. Now, below that, we have uh, campaign storage. Now, this is another uh, tier of storage that is relatively unique to the laboratory's approach to HPC. So compute jobs on the clusters are associated with computing campaigns, that is compute allocations for which they have been granted cluster time for processing. So this storage tier is designed to align with that. The allocations on this are expected to last for months up to potentially years, and they roughly align with these computing allocations on the clusters themselves. So the demands on this are for bulk, medium length residency storage, fairly high bandwidth, fairly high capacity, um, but it's only going to persist there for potentially years, but not longer than that. Now, below that, we have our archive. This archival system is provided by HPSS, and this in a very true sense is a permanent archive. There is data on this system 
that we intend to keep forever that we simply cannot afford to lose and we continuously roll this forward to new tape technologies. So obviously it is continuously expanding as more and more data is stored to it that we need to keep potentially forever. So right now it's roughly 70 petabytes in size but continuously growing. Now to put all of this in a, a different perspective, I want to discuss how we got to where we are now, why we have so many of these tiers, because frankly there are quite a lot of them, as well as the direction that we're moving in for storage at the laboratory in the future. So in the past, the traditional model for HPC storage was three rough tiers. There's of course in-system memory, then the parallel file system or scratch space, luster space in our case, and then the archive for anything you want to keep long term, and that would be a tape based archival system. Now, there are some problems with this that we experienced, and the primary issue here we feel is that in this previous three tier model, the parallel file system has some tremendous demands on it sitting in the middle there between memory and archive. As the general purpose workspace for these cluster jobs, it's required to be low latency and high bandwidth because any delays in this file system lead to delays in computation, lead to tremendous expenses in terms of running the cluster inefficiently. However, because it is this general purpose space, there's also high demands on this for capacity and uh, residency of that data. It's supposed to be resilient. And essentially, we're asking that file system to do everything because it is sitting there for providing the general purpose space for these jobs for months at a time as they continuously recalculate over their data, process it, and um, it creates sort of an unsustainable situation. You can't design a file system to efficiently meet absolutely every single one of those goals, at least not in a uh, cost-effective manner. So that is why we have gone towards this explosion of tiers, in a sense, this creation of burst buffer and campaign storage. So burst buffer was intended to take some of the bandwidth and latency pressure off of our parallel file system by absorbing the most demanding bandwidth and latency intensive workloads by absorbing those checkpoint restart workloads, um, especially in the case of bandwidth. Uh, now campaign storage was designed to absorb some of the capacity pressure on Lustre. The idea being that users can store their bulk data to campaign storage and only stage it up to that parallel file system to Lustre when they actually need to perform computation against it. So campaign is effectively a holding zone for the various data sets associated with current campaign allocations. Um, they, they stage that data down and then they only stage it back up when they actually need to process against it. So that relieves capacity pressure against Lustre. It also relieves capacity pressure against the archive because in the previous model, what we would see is that users would tend to back all of their data up to the archive in the event that, you know, potentially there was a catastrophic failure and our Lustre lost their current processing data. However, they wouldn't remove it from Lustre, they would just leave it there. They would store everything that they thought they might lose to the archive and keep it on the parallel file system. So campaign is intended to alleviate that. It has helped to absorb a fair bit of that capacity pressure on uh, both Lustre as well as on our HPSS archival system. Now going forward, is this, uh, Really, do we really need this many tiers? The answer is probably not. In a more general sense, what we probably want to head towards is four tiers. So in-system memory, obviously, then an IOPS bandwidth focused tier, then a capacity tier to help alleviate some of that pressure on archive as well as this uh, more specialized IOPS bandwidth focused tier.
And finally, the archive tier, because there will always be data sets that we simply have to keep. So you can loosely think of this as being targeted at the four primary varieties of storage media. So memory is, of course, RAM. The IOPS bandwidth tier is a flash-based tier. The capacity tier would be disk in this case because it's medium residency, fairly large capacities. And then the archive tier would, of course, be tape for anything that we need to be truly stable, need to keep forever. And really, we're trying to avoid buying these storage media for purposes that they were not meant to serve. We don't want to buy flash for capacity. We don't want to buy tape for bandwidth. We certainly don't want to buy tape for latency. And uh, we also want to help alleviate some of that archival pressure. We want to avoid keeping these data sets forever if users don't necessarily need them forever. Because this has been our experience that uh, once users store something to the archive, they tend not to ever clean it up from the archive unless they are forced to do so. That's why this capacity campaign tier is in there to give them a stable storage location that is not that permanent archive. And it's been largely successful in alleviating a fair bit of that archival data pressure. So to give you some background on campaign, because um, campaign storage was an attempt to marry the concepts of object storage with the usefulness and the familiarity, familiarity of a uh, POSIX metadata interface. So object storage, as I'm sure many of you are aware, has great benefits in terms of scalability, in terms of data resilience. However, generally speaking, though machines are fine dealing with object IDs for data access, people generally are not. People expect a tree structure. People tend to interface better with that sort of design. Also, more importantly, in our case, applications expect a POSIX-style interface to their data. So while this isn't necessarily an argument that we need to present that interface, we absolutely need to preserve that POSIX metadata in campaign storage. It needs to be staged in, preserved, and then staged out such that that POSIX metadata is identical to the original data set because the applications that run on the clusters will expect that metadata structure. And additionally, if we can present that uh, metadata interface to users, so much the better, that is what they are used to. So that is where MarFS came about. So uh, the design goals of MarFS were to present this POSIX style metadata interface to focus on data retention, the resilience of that data, as well as to try to incorporate uh, a simplicity into our design. We didn't want to reinvent the parallel file system. We didn't want to reinvent a POSIX file system. This has been done many times before. Instead, we just wanted to have a more flexible design that allowed us to incorporate these concepts as we saw fit. So what this is, is a near POSIX interface, and I'll explain what I mean by near POSIX in a moment layered atop distinct metadata and data implementations. And the actual implementation is that the metadata side of MarFS is stored to an existing POSIX parallel file system. Now, I will go into more detail on this later, but this was intended to greatly simplify the design of MarFS. As I mentioned before, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. We didn't want to recreate a parallel file system from scratch. Instead, we wanted to leverage existing file systems that had already done so much of this legwork for us. Now, of course, there are trade-offs in this design. One significant trade-off that we made in the design of MarFS is that we don't allow update in place. What I mean by that is that you cannot seek to an offset within a file and begin writing to uh, the midpoint of that file, for example. Instead, Every write is an overwrite. You must write from the beginning of the file to the end. 
Now, that would be a terrible trade-off if we were using this as a scratch space in the place of Lustre, for example, but that's not what this intent was intended for. Instead, this is for bulk stage in, stage out. And in that case, overwrite is the expected use case. You are going to write from the beginning of the file to the end during a bulk stage in. That is what we designed it for, and it simplified a significant portion of this design. Additionally, uh, we placed some restrictions on interactive use for our users. What they can't do is they can't write directly through the mount point of this file system in a traditional sense. So you can't, for example, cat a file and redirect into this MarFS campaign storage mount point. Instead, we provide tools for performing parallelized bulk data movement into and out of the MarFS file system. That allows us to much more effectively orchestrate that data movement and to perform some interesting data manipulation on the way in. So here's an actual diagram to describe that for you. Our interactive access to MarFS is provided via a fuse mount, and that provides metadata access as I said, we don't allow users to directly write through that mount point. They can technically read through it, though we don't uh, recommend that. We recommend that all data movement be performed via PF tool or parallel file tool, our bulk data movement utility. Now, both of those interface with the actual MarFS library, which in turn splits off the metadata operations from the data operations and passes them through these abstraction layers, the MDAL and DAL, or metadata abstraction layer and data abstraction layer, respectively. And then those, in turn, are passed to the underlying metadata and data implementations. So on the metadata side, as I mentioned before, we are literally using an existing POSIX parallel file system for this. We're using GPFS for our metadata storage, or um, spectrum scale, as it is known now. And metadata ops to that are a direct pass through in most cases, as in when a user performs an LS, for example, on the interactive mount point, that reader operation is passed through the MDAL and actually passed to the underlying GPFS file system, which performs a real reader on the POSIX metadata. So, what this allows us to do is get POSIX style permissions essentially for free. We are utilizing the implementation of GPFS. We're not re-implementing it. And that alleviates a tremendous amount of the complexity of designing this sort of system. Now on the data side, we have an interesting data storage design that we call multi-component. This is a multi-tiered erasure structure. What I mean by that is that we perform our own custom erasure coding across multiple storage servers and then in turn, those storage servers use ZFS to store their data and parity components to Z pools. So you end up with this two-tiered structure of protection. The top level protects you from failures of entire storage nodes, potentially entire storage racks. And then the bottom level, which is ZFS's built-in erasure coding and RAID protection against individual disk failures. Um, I'm not going to go any further into that. I actually gave a talk back in, uh, I believe it was 2017, where I discussed a lot of the details of this implementation, why we thought it was important, where the value was there. So you can uh, look that up if you're more interested, or I'd be happy to answer questions regarding it. However, moving on, uh, MarFS itself performs some interesting uh, data manipulation aspects. So. When we store files to MarFS, on the metadata side, we are actually creating an inode, actually creating a directory entry. Those inodes are then tied to their file contents, to the actual data via X adders. We attach extended attributes, X adders, to those inodes, which reference object IDs, offsets within those objects at which the file contents can be recovered. So for in the case of a read, the user process will actually traverse this metadata directory tree, locate the inode, perform a get X adder call, and then and only then can they use the information in that X adder to access the object storage side of things to access the actual data contents. 
Um, as data is ingested into MarFS, we also perform what we call packing and chunking. So in the case of packing, what I mean is that many small files will be packed together. They'll have their data streams combined into a single data object. You can see that here in the case of file B and file C, where both of those X adders reference the same object, but at different offsets within it. So their file content has been packed together into a single larger data object. Conversely, for large files, we do what we call chunking, where we break up that data stream into multi multiple more reasonably sized objects. We've seen files in the sizes of uh, hundreds of terabytes. So this chunking allows us to get much more consistently and reasonably sized objects, potentially what we, what we currently target is roughly gigabyte sized objects. So MarFS provides many interesting features. It provides data valid validation via CRCs. So as data is ingested into the system, we generate CRCs for that data stream and we actually incorporate those CRCs into the data objects as we store them. And then on read, we validate that data as it is read back out of the object storage system. Uh, it provides cross-server failure protection via that uh, dual-tiered erasure structure that I mentioned. Uh, packing and chunking give you consistently sized data objects, whether your files are incredibly small and you have many of them or incredibly large. Additionally, it, MarFS provides uh, asynchronous garbage collection, so this is something I haven't touched on. What I mean by this is that when a user performs a deletion in MarFS, that inode has an X adder on it which references a data object. Now, of course, when that inode is deleted, we need to recover that data object. However, when the user actually performs the deletion, actually issues RM-RF, for example, we don't immediately go out to the object storage servers and perform those data deletions. Instead, the references to those data objects are preserved and an asynchronous process, an admin level process, runs at a later date, collects those references and performs those deletions independent of the user. So the user isn't sitting there waiting for potentially petabytes of data to be deleted. They simply perform a metadata operation and then an asynchronous process performs the longer uh, deletion process. Now, all of these features sound like they lend themselves well to an archive system, and it, they do because campaign storage was largely designed with many archive style goals in mind for uh, resilience, for example. However, campaign storage was focused on disk media. Now, with this feature set being so diverse and interesting, at least we feel, uh, we were hoping that there would be a relatively simple way to adapt this design to an archive system to give us more flexibility in our archive implementations in the future. So this is where Markive came about. I'm finally describing Markive. However, Markive is a relatively simple design, so I don't think that this will uh, take too long to explain to all of you. The core aspect of the design is simply, what if you had MarFS store its data as normal to the ZFS pools. However, what if instead of just residing there permanently, the ZFS disk pools were more of a landing zone where data objects would be stored there and then they would be bled off to tape over time. And conversely, then when a user needed to read data back, you simply bleed all of those data objects back from tape, stream them back, and then perform the read through the MarFS interface off of these disk pools as you normally would from a campaign storage implementation. So this is a very simple design. It utilizes components that we've already worked on for years and in fact even the the tape system in this uh, particular diagram is TSM uh, or Tivoli or um, Spectrum Protect I believe it's called now. So this is all these are all components that we've worked with for a long period of time that we're familiar with and we're more orchestrating and uh, reorganizing them into an archive design. Now, 
as for the interface to this new Markive design, we, uh, we felt that interactive access to the archive was not a good fit for it. So when a user performs an interactive read, we didn't want them to be sitting there waiting on a tape mount. That's always going to be a slow process. Additionally, multiple simultaneous user access to an archive system like this could cause all kinds of contention issues with tapes potentially being remounted multiple times by multiple users or uh, as one user job preempted another. Um, also, though, you know, in addition to the user experience not being ideal for this, it's just not an efficient way to t treat your tape media. You're not going to get good bandwidth out of it and you may uh, lower its lifetime significantly. So we felt that, the, that a batch interface was the way to go with Markive. So we will take in user requests, we'll aggregate them up to a point that we feel is sufficient to justify performing an actual tape read or write, and then we'll perform those actual tape movements in bulk. We'll stream large quantities of data onto tape or off of tape, depending on the use case. This is far less abusive of the tape media we expect to get far more efficiency out of it. And um, it uh, also simplifies many aspects of the design in terms of uh, determining allocation space on the ZFS disk pools. I'll get into that a bit later. So in the case of a stage in, this is relatively simple. The user performs a uh, stage in job and uh, submits that job to the job scheduler. The job scheduler verifies that there is sufficient space available on those ZFS pools for the stage in. And if so, they, it triggers a read from the remote file system through the MarFS interface to store data objects on those ZFS pools. Then once a uh, certain data size threshold has been reached or potentially a time threshold has been reached, we actually perform the bulk movement of all of those data objects off of disk and onto tape. And then for read, of course, it's a relatively similar process. The user submits the request. We either reach our data backlog limit or our time threshold. We perform bulk stage out off of the tape system onto those ZFS pools of all of the data objects that are requested and then trigger the actual read through the MarFS interface to store that data to whatever the remote file system is. Now the components of this are relatively straightforward and many of these components, as I've mentioned before, already exist in some form. So we have the batch user interface, which submits a request to the job scheduler. And uh, that in turn can perform data movement through the MarFS interface or trigger some staging utility to stage those objects to or from the backend tape infrastructure. So you can see here that uh, most of the, most, the more complex aspects of this already exist. We already have job schedulers that run on our clusters. We already have the MarFS interface for reading to and from these ZFS disk pools. We already have tape systems such as Tivoli. Uh, it's just these orchestration components that uh, need to be implemented, the actual batch user interface and the object staging utility for interacting with that underlying tape system on the back end. So this is a, a very simple design and we feel one that uh, is considerably easier to implement than uh, you know, forming an archive system from scratch would be. Now, I said that many of these components existed. However, there are some modifications and improvements we feel could be made to MarFS, for example. So in the case of MarFS, we could use more, uh, some more streamlined administration process. That's long been a request for this. Uh, and a lot of the work in, in that department has already been done. We've got some more streamlined administration utilities in mind or already created. Uh, there are some erasure code optimizations that could be done to it. What I mean by this is um, the current iteration of campaign storage 
perform some uh, erasure coding with very large stripe sizes. It uses about um, a one megabyte block size when computing its erasure information. And we found that modifying that to use smaller block sizes gets great efficiency improvements, especially once you start to shrink those erasure stripes within the size of cache lines, of course, because then they can sit near to the CPU and you can more efficiently compute on them. Uh, we want to make improvements to the config parser. I'm not really gonna get into that too much. That's another administration focused aspect of this. What I would really like to talk about is uh, some changes that we're hoping to make to the garbage collection process and deletion process for MarFS. So the current MarFS performs deletions by duplicating inodes. Now, what I mean by this is that over here in this uh, example with file A, you have an inode sitting in the user accessible metadata tree. If the user performs a deletion against that inode, we would lose the reference to the data object that uh, it refers to. Now we don't want to do that. We want to allow our garbage collector to collect that reference and delete that object at a later time. So when this file is targeted for deletion, we duplicate that reference. We duplicate that inode and we duplicate its attached X adder. And then, and only then, do we actually remove the original entry from the user metadata tree. Now, in addition to being inefficient, because this is obviously a relatively inefficient process of actually duplicating the inode, duplicating the inode X adder, um, this process has a more core problem, and that is that it is non-atomic. What I mean by that is that this process will require at least two syscalls to complete a deletion. So you have to do a get X adder to retrieve that object reference, and then you have to do an unlink to actually delete the user metadata entry. Now, because this is a two syscall process to the underlying file system, it's a non-atomic operation, and therefore interleaved instances of this operation could result in some unexpected behavior. In this case, uh, the example I give on the right is where a process is overwriting an existing file, as in it intends to delete that reference and then attach a new reference or to uh, create a new file in its place. And then a second process, which is simply attempting to delete the exact same target. And you can see that if those processes both copy duplicate the same object reference, and then a new file is created in its place, there's the possibility that the second process will delete the new file without preserving its reference. This is a, simply a byproduct of this operation not being an atomic operation. Um, now this seems like a very core and uh, hideous problem, however, it hasn't been due to the way that we have utilized MarFS. So as I've mentioned before, MarFS is intended for campaign storage for six months to a year residency. Now, because these allocations have a defined endpoint and expiration period, when we create them, we also create data sets on the object storage nodes to associate objects with those allocations. Then when the allocation expires, we can do a bulk delete of all objects that were ever associated with an allocation. And that's because these allocations have a defined endpoint that allows us to do this. So this hasn't been an issue for campaign storage. It hasn't been something that we've run into. However, for an archive system, this is a significant problem because we are talking about data sets that do not have a defined expiration period. We can't do these bulk deletes, or at least we can't do them efficiently. So we need to find some way to address this problem. So the most obvious way to handle this is to effectively ignore it. Uh, and what I mean by that is that we could just accept that these data references will periodically leak from the metadata file system, and that we have to perform a bulk scan of all of the data objects and compare it to the metadata references to identify when this has happened. You wouldn't have to do this too regularly, but 
it's uh, certainly not an ideal situation. It's prohibitively costly and it's something that we'd rather avoid if at all possible. So a, a slightly more intelligent way to approach this and one that potentially most, some of you have uh, seen already is uh, to perform renames. You know, why are we completely duplicating these inodes into this garbage tree? Why can't we instead perform a rename of that inode into that tree? And then the reference is preserved, rename is an atomic operation. However, rename has problems in that uh, rename will implicitly overwrite any destination directory entry. And this is not something that you can easily avoid. There is a syscall called rename at two, which has a flag that you can provide to it to avoid overwriting a destination inode if it exists. However, very few file systems actually implement the rename at two syscall and none of the file systems that we were hoping to use for uh, our underlying metadata implementation actually provide a working instance of this rename at two syscall. So we decided that that was not, uh, not actually a feasible option. So that got us thinking, what if we are looking at this problem backwards? What if instead of trying to preserve these object references just before the inode is deleted, instead of you know, reaching in and trying to yank them out of there at the last minute before that inode is potentially lost, what if we can instead duplicate those references at creation time when we have far more control over this aspect? So this led to the idea of having a reference metadata tree where you create these directory entries and associated inodes beforehand as they are written into the file system. Then once you have those inodes created and their X adders attached, you simply perform a hard link of that inode into the user accessible metadata tree. The hard link syscall will implicitly not overwrite a uh, existing directory entry at the destination. And um, this allows us to have this reference to this inode preserved from the moment of creation up until its eventual deletion. And it leverages aspects of the existing POSIX file system that we get essentially for free. So you may be saying that this uh, has problems. It's definitely a very unusual approach. The most obvious issue with this is that we're greatly increasing the size of our metadata. And you might think that we're doubling the size of the metadata. That's actually not true. What we're actually doing is doubling the number of directory entries, which sounds just as bad, but directory entries actually account for a far smaller portion of metadata space than the inodes themselves. So we are only duplicating the directory entries, not the inodes. So the actual space increase is not that significant. Additionally, even at scale in our experience, uh, the size of our metadata is simply not a major issue. Even uh, in our production file system where we have tens of petabytes of data stored, we have rarely pushed up to any significant metadata size. I think we're sitting at under half metadata utilization and uh, have at least 40 petabytes of data stored to this file system. Hopefully that's accurate. It's something approximately to that scale. Now, another issue and one that is uh, something we have to think about is what about collisions on creation? I had talked about the issue of renaming into the garbage tree before and the possibility of collisions there. Can't we run into collisions at file creation time in this reference metadata tree? We can, however, the open syscall, of course, provides the O exclusive flag to avoid file overwrites. So we can at least avoid smashing any existing metadata references. Uh, this does raise the possibility that you could have repeated collisions and have an open or a, a file create through MarFS fail. Uh, that's highly unlikely, but if that is the case, we could simply fail with an eBusy error code which does represent the state of the file system and it's up to the 
user of the MarFS interface or the uh, application written for the MarFS interface to identify that error code and potentially retry or to return it to the user. Now, this does give some significant benefits. The most prominent of which is that it greatly simplifies a lot of our metadata operations and metadata implementation from RFS. The vast majority of metadata ops can simply be passed directly to that user tree. Rename and unlink can freely target any directory entries in that tree where we know that the actual inode will be preserved because we have that hard link that initial hard link into our reference metadata tree. We will not lose that inode, we will not lose that X adder, and in turn, we will not leak any object references. This also has benefits from RFS in terms of uh, garbage collection and quota processing. So I've already mentioned the garbage collection process. MarFS also has a quota process, which performs scans of the file system to identify the logical size of these inodes and to update quota information based on that. This is because the uh, underlying file systems, they reflect quotas in terms of actual data storage, but we're, we're using that underlying metadata file system for metadata only. All of those inodes have a logical size only. They do not have any actual file contents. Therefore, we have to perform some sort of scan, some sort of incorporation of logical file size to update MarFS quotas. Now, with this, this modified metadata structure, we can actually combine these once separate processes of garbage collection and quota calculation into a single scan of this metadata reference tree. So the underlying file system, as part of the implementation of hard links is required to maintain a link count on the inode. So by scanning this reference tree, we simply stat every single inode. If the inode has a link count of one, we know that the only reference to that inode is in this metadata reference tree, this admin tree itself. Therefore, that file is trash. Old user references to that inode have been deleted so we can recover objects associated with that. Conversely, if we look at that link count and it's greater than one, we know that that user still has references to that inode, is still referencing that data. Therefore, we will count that data against their user quota. Now, so this, this means that uh, it's a single scan of this reference tree, gets us both garbage collection and quota information. Additionally, we have complete control over the structure of this reference tree. Therefore, we can design it such that these scans are highly parallelizable. So we can have reference trees associated with each top level namespace. This is the current plan for this. And what that'll mean is that we can parallelize these scans across every single top level namespace of the file system itself. We can also further structure those reference trees themselves uh, locating inodes and objects at specific positions. And we feel that this will allow us to parallelize these scans as widely as we could possibly want to do. So we expect this to be actually a very quick scanning process. And we'll just be doing effectively read dir stat of the underlying file system, which is what many of these parallel file systems are optimized for anyway. So to go over this design, hopefully I've made it clear. The idea is that we have this reference metadata tree and every single inode will have a directory entry, a hard link into that metadata tree for the purposes of these admin level garbage collection and quota scans. Those inodes may also have any number of hard links into the user accessible metadata tree and we simply scan those inodes, check their link count, and then based on those link counts, determine whether or not we need to perform a garbage collection or a uh, quota addition for that file. And these object references associated with the X adders of each of these inodes will always be preserved until they are actually destroyed by the garbage collector itself. This avoids race conditions, this simplifies a great deal of our uh, metadata implementation because on the user side of things, 
almost all metadata operations are a direct pass through to that user tree. Read dir, rename, unlink, stat, direct pass throughs, the exception being stat to a degree, because all we simply have to do is we perform the stat operation against the underlying file system, get that structure back, and um, simply decrement the link count of that stat structure by one. And then that now reflects the link count that the user would expect to see from the file system. So this is a uh, definitely an unusual uh, way to approach this, definitely an unusual use of hard links, I feel. However, we feel it gives us some significant benefits, it eliminates race conditions, and it should provide us with a more efficient and uh, resilient file system in the future. Now, that's all I have for you today. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation. Assuming I'm uh, in the chat at the time that this is actually running, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. And um, as the slide says, please let the organizers know what you thought of this session. Thank you very much for your time.